Shalom, y'all. Yes, your eyes are not deceiving you. It's me, Patya, in Sfat with another amazing installment of the Midrash series. Now, we made it through Tishrei, a month full of holidays and goodness. I mean, we had Rosh Hashanah and then a Shabbos, and then we had Yom Kippur and then another Shabbos, and then we had the first days of Sukkot. You might know it as the Festival of the Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, but it's really called Sukkot, and that's a week long, and then a Shabbos in the middle, and then a Shabbos after, and did I mention there was also the Tzom of Gedalia, the Fast of Gedalia. So we were just having a party over here, and now we're after, and we're ready to get going again. I missed these videos so much, I hope you did too, and enough of me blabbing about nothing. Let's get down to business now. It's very, very exciting because today we are finally starting the second book of the Chumash that is called Exodus. No, that's not what it's called. It's called Shmot. Shmot in Hebrew means names. Let's just jump right in. Is this glare here annoying? There's really, it's the holiness of the city that I live in shining in through the window. Okay. Let's go. So we left off finishing Bereshit, which is so funny because this last Parsha, the portion of the Torah that we read on Shabbos, um, this past Shabbos, which was yesterday, <laughs> is Bereshit. So we finished just in time to start all over again. And let's go. I'm so excited about them. The Midrash on the Exodus, well, it's all so good, but... This is really good. Okay, I say that every time, blah, blah, blah. Let's get started. Now, all of Yaakov's descendants were living in Goshen. Remember this place that was kind of outside where they could take care of their, their flocks um, because the Egyptians were not into sheep and goats. They worshiped them, so, right? And they were out to the side where they could study Torah, keep to themselves, and then, so as long as the tribes were alive, all of the Jews avoided any kind of social contact with the Egyptians. But after they died, the Jews slowly started entering Egyptian society. They didn't want to just be confined to this portion of land in Goshen. Um, and so they started spreading out. They started mingling with the Egyptians. They started going to the theaters. They started going to circuses. They felt attracted to the Egyptian cult of animal worship and imitated these Egyptian practices. Although the tribe of Levi and the other tzaddikim of the tribes never became idol worshippers. So, um, do I do this? I don't, I want to put in a nugget here, but I wonder if I should, okay. So the Hazonish, huge tzaddik um, when questioned about the actual moral standard of the children of Israel explained that despite their level of righteousness and the righteousness of the Jewish women and the open miracles they experienced experience, uh, they were actually totally steeped in idol worship and so this might seem very strange to us um, if we were not aware of the fact that the inclination towards idol worship was so unbelievably strong that as we are today, we can't fathom this. Uh, so from the time of the men of the great assembly, uh, which is known as the Anshe uh, Knesset Agadol, 120 sages, um, this, was, uh, this was founded by um, Ezra. So we're talking about around 520 CE to um, 70 CE. Now, uh, so in, in the Jewish year, it would be 3,448. But what I want to talk to you about this is that this is a very, very, very interesting topic. Um, the, the passion that existed to worship idols. Now, let's go back. Uh, one of the best stories to indicate this, and this is, 
I don't know why, but I, I love it so much. One of the best stories to indicate this is a story from the Talmud in Sanhedrin 102b. And it's talking about Menashe, the wicked idolat idolater king, the son of Hiskiao, I believe, I think, and, um, and Rav Ashi. So Menashe had died, and Rav Ashi was teaching in the yeshiva, and he said, okay, Today we're going to talk about uh, our good friend Menashe um, and uh, how we ran to serve idols and blah, 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 blah. So that night in, in a dream, Menashe came to Rav Ashi and he said, hey, listen, and I, of course I'm paraphrasing. He said, I'm not your friend. I'm not your father's friend. I'm talking like that's literally what he says. Um, so like. What are you even talking about? Let me ask you a question. When you do hamotzi, the blessing for bread, um, where do you cut the bread? And Rabbi Ashi says, I don't know. And he says, well, let me tell you something. You're going to cut the bread in the darkest piece. Blah, 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 blah. And he, teach him, he teaches this, uh, this law, this halacha to him. And Rabbi Ashi says, okay, so if you're such a big Torah scholar, if you're such a big chacham, then why did you worship idols? And he's like, okay, let me tell you something. If you had lived when I lived, you would have picked up your, your clothes, the hem of your clothes to run to worship idols. At least I had the, dis the decency to walk slowly to do it. You, you have no idea what you're talking about. After that night, Rav Ashi comes back to the yeshiva and he starts with, let's speak about something that we learn from our teacher, Rav Manashi. So when we talk about idol worship, it's hard for us to understand the proclivity for this um, in those times. Now, this, they, the, the sages, um, the Great Assembly actually got together and they canceled out this desire with prayer. They canceled the desire for idol worship because it was too great. It was too intense for the people, but it came at a great price. Now, does anybody know the price that had to be paid to cancel the desire for idol worship? As a result, we lost prophecy. Now, we do still have prophecy to certain degrees. Uh, they say that, you know, a 60th of sleep can be prophecy. They say that from the mouths of children or fools, even though fools, it's like a bad, uh, you know, people that don't have full faculties uh, of their mind um, have a kind of prophecy. The animals have prophecy. And so it's to a much, it's a very, very slight degree. But why? Because everything always has to be in a balance. You can't just take away the desire for idol worship because when you take that out, you also lose the prophecy. Now, there's a great midrash on this. I'm not going to get into it now. <laughs> I got really excited about that. But it's important to know. We, you know, we hear this word thrown around a lot, especially in the context of faith, about freedom of choice a free will. We have a free will to serve God. So what does that mean? What is the free will? Because at the end of the day, Hashem is guiding absolutely all things. So the only free choice that we have is if we see God in this world or not. And that if you really see him, then you will do his will. Like the angels, Angels are commonly referred to as almost like robots. Why? Because they don't have free choice. Why do they not have free choice? Because they can see the greatness of God. Um, as it says uh, in the scriptures that the only real free man, the only man that's really free is a man that is a slave to the truth. And if you're here, and if you think like me, we know what that truth is. It's Hashem, the one God, and His holy sweet Torah. So they destroyed, uh, have, uh, they, they destroyed the want for idol worship, and with it, it was the loss of prophecy. And at the same time, 
This is when they put together the formulated structure of prayer because before that, Jews just prayed. You picked a time of day, you went and talked to God, boom. But because of our spiritual decline at the time, they codified it. Cod that's not a word. Don't say that ever. Oh, hello. Um, they, they put uh, a, a specific formulation of prayer together that we still subscribe to today. So I'm not going to go into detail on this, but it is important to note that there is a very strong connection between losing the desire for idol worship, losing um, prophecy, and also closing the, the canon, the scripture. The 24 books of the Tanakh, and that's it, closed and finished. And it's also interesting, and I'm not going to go into this, but this all happened around the end of the first temple period, coming up to the second temple period, where there are some famous personalities that would cause um, a split in uh, religious belief. And I'm going to leave that there. And if, uh, if you get it, you get it. But it's very, very interesting. So let's move on. So it has to be understood that although the Jews externally imitated the deeds and the practices of the Egyptians, their spiritual values were completely different. Okay. So it's taught that even in this heavily polluted atmosphere of Egypt, the most degenerate place of the world is actually referred to as the nakedness of the earth, even though the translation is even more gross. Ichs. as we would say here in Israel. So it hit the 49th level of impurity. Once you hit 50, there's no coming out. It's one of the reasons God took the Jews out as quickly as possible because one more rung. Ooh, I could go into a whole spiel now about this, um, the number 49 and what it represents and the number 50 and what that represents. <laughs> but I don't want to get detracted. Not on our first video back. Okay, so during the entire time that the Jews were in this environment, they maintained a very high level of moral standards. And it is taught that with one exception, in the case of Shlomis Bat Divri, which the Torah uh, specifies, that there were no intermarriages with non-Jews, um, and that Hashem later would testify that all of their children were pure and unsullied lineage. Now, the Jews distinguished themselves in three ways. It says that the Jews did three things that made them worthy of being redeemed by Hashem. One, they kept their names. Two, they kept their clothing. And three, they kept their language. Which makes me very hopeful because here we keep our names we keep our clothing and we also keep our language. So, um, after the death of Yaakov's sons, Pero decreed that the Brit Milah circumcision was forbidden. So, as a, you know, as a result, all of the Jews discontinued the practice of circumcision except for the tribe of Levi. When Hashem saw that assimilation was progressing, He changed the sentiments of the Egyptians towards the Jews, causing them to feel hatred towards them. This is a common theme throughout history and the way that Hashem works. Um, when Jews moved to different communities uh, in the exile and they start assimilating, God will turn the nations on them to put them back into place. So now Pharaoh, Paro is getting ready to decree slave labor. And he did this unbelievably cleverly. Did I say that? I said that. So, um, although the children of Israel external, externally assumed the Egyptian practices, Hashem loved them because they were the children of the Avot, of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And therefore, he caused them to multiply in extraordinary manner. Jewish women would give birth to six children at a time. And um, none of these children were ever stillborn or weak and they were all strong and healthy. And the more that they were oppressed, 
the more children they had. So as they were having all of these children, the Egyptians became afraid. Their numbers are outgrowing our numbers. And soon we're going to have a real problem because if they want to go to war with us, we're going we're to have some trouble. So the Egyptian nobleman warned Paro, there is a great likelihood of a future war between us and the kings of Canaan. They may think of retrieving the riches that we collected from everyone throughout the years of famine. In case of warfare, the Jews will join our enemies and they will easily overtake us, so we must take action against them. And Paro rebuked them and he said, are you kidding? If it wasn't for Yosef, we would all be dead. They saved us and they saved our country. How could you possibly think of harming them? The Egyptians were enraged at Paro's sympathy for the Jews, and so they ousted him from the throne, exposing him to a fate of shame. And after a few months, um, he decided that it wasn't worth it, uh, and it was more profitable for him to comply with the demands of the nobility of the, of the Egyptian people. So he announced that he wished to resume his position, having formulated a new policy towards the Jews. Now it says... Um, in the text that a new king arose there's actually different opinions of this if it was the same king or a different king or what it meant by new meant that he had a new idea that he had a new point of view and that he decided to have a new kind of relationship with the jews um so he now paro acted as though he had never known yosef even though he had sustained the population during the years of famine, and just as Paro claimed that he knew nothing of no uh, Yosef, soon after that he, de he declared that he knew nothing of Hashem as well. Similarly, by denying the gratitude of Yosef, Paro revealed the baseness of his character, which would ultimately cause him to deny God. So Paro made a cunning plan to weaken the children of Israel. He separated the husband from their wives, to prevent more children and he made proclamations throughout Goshen and the entire country which stated hey your country needs you and the cities of Pitom and Ramses are in urgent need of renovation and so uh, he set out a campaign for everyone to come together and help to rebuild and so he said that whoever signs up will receive generous payment every day and every man and woman who is loyal to the country is expected to volunteer for this worthy cause. To attract the Jews, Paro himself appeared at the site with a spade and a shovel in his hand. And so if someone thereafter claimed that this type of work was below his dignity, he was remonstrated, saying, Are you more delicate in nature than Paro? He also helped to build. The Egyptian nobility enrolled, and so did many Egyptians. So how could the Jews be indifferent to the patriotic cause? They came to work, and Paro's supervisors compiled the list of all the names who appeared for work. The first, days, the, the first day, the Jews worked enthusiastically. They made rapid progress in building. And so Paro and his soldiers counted the work that they did. They made that a number, and that was going to be the expected quota of every day's work. For a month's time, Paro paid the workers, and after that, he stopped paying them. And every day, more and more in the, of the Egyptians would disappear until after 16 months, not a single Egyptian was working on the work site. Now the Jews were informed that the king had no more money to pay for their labor, and they protested, but Paro organized an army of brutal policemen. They threw themselves at the Jews and said, you must keep working for the king. The Egyptian taskmasters were given the job of ensuring that everybody appeared for work in the morning, and they also forced the Jews to return all the money that they were previously given for the work that they had done. One tribe among the children of Israel were never drafted by Paro, that is, the tribe of Levi. When Paro issued the original proclamation, they did not appear at work saying, we are constantly engaged in Torah study and have no time to come. Subsequently, Paro left them alone, and they remained free until the end of exile. Had they stepped out of the Beit Midrash, to volunteer for their services, the consequences would have been almost a hundred years of slavery. The Leviim had been instructed by their forefathers, Yaakov, to concentrate on learning Torah. The building site of these two cities um, was specifically chosen because they were situated on swamps, meaning that no matter how hard the Jews worked, it kept sinking into the ground. 
So you're, you're, you're doing slave labor with no purpose, which is a kind of psychological warfare. Not only did the children of Israel have to do slave labor for the king, but also the Egyptians forced them to perform work in their houses and fields after they finished working on the building site. Besides enslaving the Jews with backbreaking labor, they devised one form of cruelty after another to torture them. An Egyptian would assign a job to a Jew without telling him how long it would last and tell him just continue working. Along with other mental agony and physical strain, the Egyptians used to order the children of Israel to perform work suitable um, to perform work that was suitable in the, for day in the night and work that was suitable in the night and the day. They also made women do men's work, the more physical labor, and then they had men do the women's work, like um, housework and cooking and cleaning. Um, they thought uh, by doing this, they would decrease their numbers. And Paro gave orders that the men should be detained in their labor camps in the fields overnight while the women would remain in the town. So Paro's decree was more effective in directing the hearts of the children of Israel to Hashem than were the 40 years of guidance and teaching under Moshe Rabbeinu in the desert. They cried out to Hashem and they did repentance. And when Amram gave birth to a girl, they called her Miriam meaning the Egyptians have embittered their lives, since at that time the slave labor was intensified, but the Jewish woman would not be defeated. They were descendants of Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, who had lived to build the Jewish nation, and they were determined to continue this undertaking, overcoming all obstacles. So when the women went out to draw water, Hashem caused them to find little fish in it. With these in hand, they ran out to the fields, they refreshed their husbands with jars of hot water and cooked fish, they washed and fed their husbands. They gave them words of comfort and encouragement. They continued to have children with the greatest faith in God that Hashem would protect them and their children. And Hashem responded to their trust by performing open miracles. When the children, when, when the Jewish women gave birth to the children in the fields and they were forced to abandon their newborns, Hashem sent an angel to feed and clean the infants just as he sustains and feeds all of his creatures. And whenever the Egyptians' patrols arrived in the field to search for Jewish babies, the earth opened up to conceal the infants. The Egyptians were, were stupefied at their disappearance, thinking that they were being deceived by some form of magic. They were determined to kill the children and turn over the soil with their plowshares, because they knew that magic can exert no power further than the depth to which a hand can reach. They were therefore certain that once they tilled the soil to the depth of one hand's length, the children would be theirs to be exterminated. But they never discovered a single child. As soon as the children had left, the children sprouted forth from the ground like grass of the field. And when they grew up, they swarmed back in flocks to the homes of their parents. And the Egyptians were mystified. How could it be that the Jewish nation is continuing to grow and to flourish? The nation of Israel says to Hashem, you see what they're doing, the plots the nations have contrived against us? Let them plan, said Hashem. No plan ever comes to fruition unless I permit it. This is such an important phrase from Hashem, that uh, when we're struggling with different things in our life, uh, when bad things happen, uh, and it's a teaching of Rabbi Nachman Mabreslav that uh, a curse is only an unwanted blessing. So this statement from God no plan ever comes to fruition unless I permit it. That means that anything that's happening to us at any time in our life, always 100% was signed off. It was, it was signed off by Hashem. Hashem gave that situation the okay. And by knowing that, that God approved that message, that we need to learn how to accept it with love and faith and this is a high level, even joy. Okay. So the second decree of Paros was um, to kill the Jewish children through the Jewish midwives. Um, also, uh, well, we'll probably get to it later. I'm not going to get distracted. Let's keep going. So Paro realized that the labor camp plan had failed. Um, and so we ha he said to his advisors, we have to change our strategy. 
Power was afraid to murder the Jews openly, fearing both public opinion and divine punishment. He therefore looked for agents to murder Jewish children secretly. He decided to call for the Jewish midwives, whom he would have uh, carry out this gruesome, gruesome mission. He thought that uh, in the eyes of heaven, not he, but the midwives would bear the responsibility for the murderous deeds. Pero then ordered two Jewish midwives, pop quiz, who knows their Bible? What are the names of these two Jewish midwives? Shifra and Pua. But in actuality, who are these? These are Yocheved, the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu, and Aaron Cohen, and Miriam the prophetess, and Pua is Miriam. Um, they were known by different names because these names demonstrated the, the great kindness and, uh, they had for their work and for these Jewish children. Um, so Yocheved was called Shifra because she used to wash and clean the infants. And uh, Shifra comes from the root Meshaperet, which means to beautify in Hebrew. And uh, Miriam was called Pua because she knew how to pacify the crying babies by making like a cooing sound to them. Now, why is this so um, Why is this so extraordinary? Like we read the text, but we don't understand. We're talking about Miriam, the prophetess. And she grew up during slavery, uh, where the Egyptians were doing everything they could to keep men and women separate. And while knowing that she would probably never be married, she would never have her own children, that she would never get to experience that in her life, she still found the love and the compassion to go to other women who were having babies and to coo at them and to take care of them. So deep was her chesed and her loving kindness. So, um, she had uh, a prophetic vision and she calls out, my mother in the future will give birth to the savior, savior of the nation of Israel. So at the time of the proclamation, she was only five and she used to accompany her mother uh, to perform the task uh, assigned them of killing the new Jewish babies. So Peril commanded to both of them that they should only kill the boys, but let the girls remain alive. And as soon as little Miriam heard the vile decree, she exclaimed, For shame, what a wicked king. Woe to him on the day that God will punish him. Paro paled and motioned to the executioner to lead Miriam away from her death. <clears throat> Not much has changed, as you see. Um, so when Paro heard her say this to him, he led her away to her death, but Yocheved fell down before him and started begging for her mercy for her daughter. Why should you be angry at the words of a little girl? She's only a child. So finally, Paro allowed Miriam to remain alive. And both Yocheved and Miriam left the palace with clear knowledge that defying the king's command meant death for both of them. But they had no intention, intention of obeying him because they feared Hashem more than they feared a human king. How could we ever perpetrate the horrible deed of killing Jewish children? Didn't our forefather Avram open ends to sustain even the Gentiles? then how could we act in the opposite manner, wiping out and destroying children? From then on, um, they were not merely content to fulfill their obligation as midwives, but they also saw fit that the newborn children of poor families would be sustained. They would collect food from the houses of the rich women, bringing it to those of the poor. Moreover, before every delivery, they stood in prayer before God. They begged God that the child should be born healthy. Hashem, they prayed, you know that we act in defiance of Paro's will in order to fulfill your will. Let this child enter the world free from defect. Even if you had destined him to be born lame or blind, they will say, the child was born handicapped since the midwives attempted to kill him. They also begged Hashem on behalf of children and the mothers who were destined to die in childbirth. Be merciful and grant life to them, they prayed, so that we should not be blamed for their deaths. Hashem accepted their prayers, and all the children delivered by them were born healthy and well. Thus it can be said that Yocheved and Miriam actually granted life to Jewish children. Paro soon discovered that no Jewish babies were being killed, and he had Yocheved and Miriam brought to his palace. You are guilty of having transgressed my orders. 
Yocheved explained, you have to understand, Your Majesty, the Jewish women are not like the Egyptian women. Our forefathers likened us to beasts, the tribe of Judah is likened to a lion, and Binyamin to a wolf, and Naphtali to a hind. Just as beasts give birth without any assistance, so do Jewish women not have need of midwives during birth. We are only summoned afterwards to give a helping hand. Yocheved, in fact, spoke the truth. The Jewish women in Egypt were righteous and delivered without pain. Paro was satisfied with the explanation and dismissed them. Subsequently, however, he regretted that he believed their words. He sent soldiers to Amram's house to have Yocheved and Miriam arrested and executed. But Hashem made a miracle for them. They became invisible to Paro's soldiers, swallowed up by the walls of the house. Hashem said they are deserving of miracles because of their great fear of me. Besides deliverance from Paro, Yocheved and Miriam received eternal reward. Miriam later married Kalev ben Yefune from the tribe of Yehuda and thus became the mother of the royal dynasty of David. And Yocheved became the mother of the first Kohen Gadol, Aaron, and Moshe, and the ancestress of all future Kohanim and Leviim. Now, Paro's third decree, throwing all of the boys into the Nile. So Paro realized that he could not depend on the midwives to decrease the number of Jews. So uh, he was also prompted by a terrifying dream that he had that haunted him. And in his dream, he had seen himself sitting on his throat and an old man appeared to him holding a big scale, which he hung up before Paro. Oh. Watermelon. I had to sneeze. They say if you say watermelon, it goes away. <laughs> okay, so holding up a scale, and he reached out with one hand and grasped all of the nobles and the princes of the Egyptian court, bound them, and placed them on one side of the scale. And then he brought a little white lamb and put it on the other side of the scale, and behold, the scale continued dropping until the little white lamb had pulled them all down. Paro awoke with a cold sweat on his face, and he called his three chief counselors. This is great! This is going to blow your mind out. Well, it did to me when I learned about it. So after this dream, Paro calls his three advisors and you know them all. One is Bilam, the famous mu uh, <laughs> musician. I don't know. I don't think he was a musician. I don't know. He was a magician. He was, uh, uh, he was a prophet. He was a great prophet. Um, and we, We'll talk more about it. I'm going to get lost in this because it's so exciting. Okay. Bilam, who there's a whole story, right, about later. Then there's Itro, Jethro, the father of Zipporah. Zipporah is the wife of Moshe Rabenu. That's right. Okay. So we have Bilam, we have Itro, and we have Yov, Job. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so... And this is, we're about to get into another amazing, amazing, amazing example of how Hashem runs the world. That is Mida, Keneged, Mida, measure for measure. So Bilam, upon hearing the dream, he declared, there's no doubt about the meaning of your dream. It foretells that a Jewish child will one day destroy Egypt. So then Paro asked all of them their opinion and um, how to deal with the Jews. And Itro spoke up and said, as you know, whenever we attempted to harm the Jews in the past, we became the losers. You recall that the late Paro who detained Sarah for one night was stricken with a plague. So was Avimelech, the king of the Plishtim, who also took Sarah. Furthermore, it's our duty to remember the debt of gratitude we owe to Yosef, which obligates us to abstain from any evil plans against the Jews. Itro watched the growing displeasure on Paro's face and realized that he was now in great danger. So he fled. He ran away uh, from the palace where he fled to Midian, where he became the high priest, where he would later meet Moshe Rabenu. Bilan then stated his opinion. Listen to me, majesty. I am well acquainted with this nation, and I will tell you how to deal with them. As it is clear from history, fire does not harm them. Their God saved Avram from the fiery furnace. Their God saved... Um, swords don't kill them. We know that Itzchak was saved from Avram's knife on the Mizbeach, on the altar, during the Akeda. And it's clear that they are immune to slavery. Yaakov was enslaved by Levan with all conceivable types of labor, and yet he emerged successful and wealthy. So as far as I can see, there is only one element that has power over them, water. Command your soldiers to throw the Jewish babies into the Nile to drown. All of Paro's astrologers agreed to Bilam's words. 
because they thought that Hashem would be an unable to punish them for drowning Jewish children. They knew the principle that Hashem deals with man, Mida Keneged Mida, for casting children into the water. They reasoned that they would incur the punishment of death by drowning. However, they assumed, and you know what they say about assuming, that because Hashem had bound himself by an oath to Noah, never to bring another mabul, mabul, flood, on the world, they would inevitably escape the punishment. Their reasoning, however, was again faulty because Hashem had only sworn not to flood the entire earth again, but he was still able to bring a flood upon an individual nation. Now, lastly, Paro also consulted his third advisor, Yov, um, to hear his position on the matter, but Yov chose to remain silent and Paro then decided to implement Bilam's counsel. So what is one of the, the Mida, Kenegid Mida, here, um, specifically, it, I'm sure you guys have read Job. Um, uh, there's a great lecture, maybe if I can remember Bizrat Hashem, I can put it into the description about the book of Yov. And this is classic, the, uh, I mean, this story uh, for Bible enthusiasts, right, of uh, the suffering that is brought upon Yov. Um, and, it, and if you have an opportunity, it's not very long. So it, it's, uh, I, would, I would suggest you to pull out your Bible and to read the book of Yov. It's extremely powerful. But do you remember the dialogue between the Satan and Hashem? And Hashem's like, he's never going to not serve me. He is righteous. He's a righteous Gentile, by the way, um, which speaks against any kind of discrimination by the Jews. Itro is also a Gentile. Later he converted. But... Bo Yitro has a Parsha named after him in the Torah, and Yov has an entire book in the Torah that we read uh, that we read during one of our holidays. And so, what was the Mida Keneged Mida with Yov? That just as Yov remained silent when Paro asked him about murdering Jewish children, when Yov was being afflicted and praying to God to give him a salvation, Hashem also remained quiet. Think about that. There's so much more stuff on that. But again, let's not get distracted. How much do we have? Okay, let's see how far we can go. Okay. Oh, here we go. So all three counselors were repaid by Hashem, measure for measure. Itro, who risked his life to render true judgment, was rewarded with descendants who became leaders of the Sanhedrin and would have the opportunity to judge others fairly. Love that. Bilam, who counseled that the Jews should be slaughtered, was eventually killed by them himself. And Yov, who remained silent, was afflicted with suffering. One who has the opportunity to protest against evil and remains indifferent is deemed culpable by Hashem. Let's read that one more time and then move on, okay? One who has the opportunity to protest against evil and remains indifferent is deemed culpable by God. Now, when the Egyptians learned of the edict that spelled death for the Jewish boys, they were very happy about it and celebrated it greatly. Since they were the most immoral of nations, their immediate thought was, yay, all the boys will be dead and the girls will be alive and then we can take them for ourselves. Let's get into the birth of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Moshe had Moshe and Kamal Moshe. There it will never ever, it's one of the 13 fundamental principles of the Jewish faith. There will never be another prophet like Moshe Rabbeinu ever. And his word is true. Moshe is true. His Torah is true. Boom. Okay, so the leader of the Sanhedrin, his name was Amram, and he's also one of the four people that never sinned. Remember this. He was a perfect tzaddik. And um, so when Paro's new law was issued, Amram, Amram had already had two children. He already had Miriam, who was the oldest, and then Aaron. And... Uh, So it says here that Yocheved was actually three months pregnant with a child. 
So when Amram heard this news about the edict for newborn male Jewish children, he said, then why should we even have more children just to see them slaughtered? So to set an example for all Jews to follow, he publicly divorced his wife, and subsequently all of the Jewish men also divorced their wives. But Miriam, this is so... But Miriam argued, and she said to her father, <laughs> you, your decision is, uh, is worse than Paro. What you're decreeing right now is even worse than Paro. It's harsher than his decree. While Paro's law affects only the killing of male children, you're preventing the birth of boys and girls. Paro may deprive them all of their bodies, but their souls will live on in the next world. You, however, prevent their souls from entering the world at all. Moreover, I'm sure that Paro's edict will soon be withdrawn, while your decree will endure. Amram acknowledged the force of her argument, and he decided that Yocheved should be united with him in a conspicuous way so that all of the nation of Israel would re be reunited. So they made a chuppah, a wedding canopy, and Aaron and Miriam danced in the front of it, and Bnei Israel again followed Amram's example and remarried their wives. I, I don't know why I feel compelled, but I just have to say that when a husband and wife are together intimately, even if no actual physical children come as a result of that, spiritual children are being made. Okay, that's important. That's one of the reasons of the way a man handles his breed and protects his seed is so important because it's life and death. And even if you don't see an actual physical child, there are spiritual children and forces at work here, which are so incredibly important. Okay, let's move on. So a miracle happened to Yocheved, um, who at that time was 130 years old. Her wrinkles and gray hair disappeared and she was rejuvenated. Um, so in the Etz Yosef, they explain that uh, had she remained old looking, then the children of Israel would have reasoned that he only took her back because in any case she wasn't able to have children, so what difference did it make? Um, and so they wouldn't want to take back their younger wives because they would have children and they didn't want those children to die. So Hashem made a miracle to make her young and capable of bearing children. Uh, so that they clearly understood that they were meant to continue propagating. So during that time, the Egyptian astrologers told Pyro and said, We foresee that the Redeemer, of the Redeemer of the Jews is about to be born. However, we're not sure whether he is Jewish or Egyptian. The astrologer's vision was obscured since Moshe, although born from a Jewish mother, would be raised by an Egyptian woman, Batya, the daughter of Pyro, in Pyro's own palace. If there is a possibility that a redeemer might be Egyptian, declared Pharaoh, we must include all newborn Egyptian boys in the Edict of Annihilation for the coming nine months. The Egyptians were enraged by Pharaoh's decree. They um, were very upset. Now, Pharaoh's astrologers firmly believed that the future redeemer would perish if only he were thrown into the Nile. Their astrological visions revealed that he would be punished through water. They interpreted this to mean that he would drown. In reality, this prediction referred to Moshe's later punish punishment through the water of uh, Meribah, uh, where it was decreed upon him that he would die in the wilderness and he would not be able to enter the land of Israel. Right? Hashem tells him to, you know, s tap the rock to make water come out, and he s strikes another time. But I know you know what I'm talking about. So, um, on the seventh of Adar... Moshe Rabbeinu was born. As it happens, on the 7th of Adar, he also uh, moved into the real world, the next world. So on the 7th of Adar, a son was born to Yocheved and Amram. And when he entered the world, the house shone with the light of the Shekhinah. Moshe Rabbeinu was born circumcised. And that was a sign that he would be a tzaddik, a righteous man. Amram kissed his daughter Miriam and he told her, you were right. You prophesied that your mother would give birth to the Redeemer of the children of Israel. Amram and Yocheved named their son Yakutiel. So, interesting fact, that's actually Moshe Rabbeinu's real name from his pe parents, even though he has several names that he's called. I think, ah, it's right here. Great, convenient. Um, so his real name, Moshe Rabbeinu's real name is Yakutiel. Um, he, actually, he's called ten names. Did I say seven? Ten. He's called Yered. 
meaning he brought down the divine Torah to the earth. Two. Where am I? Ah, okay. The, his next name is Avigdor. This name is derived from the root of fence, like a getter. Moshe was the head of all the sages who instituted fences as precautionary measures to protect Torah law from being violated. Hever. This name denotes that Moshe brought the children of Israel closer to their father in heaven by means of the Mishkan um, and uh, the, uh, by means of the Mishkan. Avisoho. Since Moshe was the greatest prophet who ever lived, Soho comes from the word envision. Yakutiel, which means he taught the Bnei Israel to place their hope and trust in God. Um, Avi Zenuach. He was more successful than any leader who succeeded him in causing the Jews to abandon idol worship. Um, and Tovia, Moshe was called this because he was born. His mother saw that he was good. Tov. Tov is good. Okay. Like I always say, Tov lo dodeshem. It's so good to thank God, everybody. You know that. And Shmaya. Uh, Moshe deserved this name because Hashem would listen. Shma is to listen. Shomea. Shma. Shmaya. Um, to listen to his prayers, and Ben Netanel, he was given this name because he was the man to whom Hashem gave the Torah. And nevertheless, with all the names that he had, the Torah uses no other name than Moshe, since Batya, Bat Paro, Batya, the daughter of Paro, saved your life. I swear that I will only call you by the name that she gave you. Until Moshe was three months old, Yocheved was able to conceal him from the Egyptians. But they had begun to observe her only after her husband had taken her back, counting nine months from then. So when Moshe was three months old, Yocheved was warned, the Egyptian soldiers are looking for your infant. And she said, no, I'll hide him well. And they said, no, you don't understand. The Egyptian women are going to bring their babies. They're going to make them cry. And once they start crying, your baby will start crying and they will find him. So upon hearing of this devious trick, Yocheved feared that her son's life would be lost if he remained in the house, so she made a plan. She took a little casket, smeared the inside with lime and the outside with pitch to make it waterproof. She constructed the little canopy over it because she said sadly, I will never see the canopy of your wedding. And she deposited this basket with the baby inside close to the banks of the River Nile. While preparing her infant for this dangerous undertaking, she slapped her oldest child, Miriam, on the head and said, What happened to your prophecy, Miriam? Miriam did not lose faith. She accompanied her mother to the river and remained standing at the edge of the Nile, waiting to see how Hashem would fulfill his word. Yoheved had good reason to deposit the chest into the Nile rather than to hide it in any of the numerous other places because she hoped that if she put him into the water, then the astrological sign would indicate that the Jewish savior had been cast into the Nile and the Egyptians would abandon the persecution of potential candidates. This is what precisely happened. And as soon as Moshe's basket was set afloat in the Nile, the astrologers harried to Paro to tell him that it's done. The redeemer of the Jews has been thrown into the water. Paro immediately abolished his edict and thenceforth no more children were thrown into the Nile. In truth, Hashem saved all the Jewish children who had been cast into the river. He commanded the river to spit them out onto dry land. The river deposited them on desert lands where they were nourished by Hashem, who commanded the rock on one side of the children to produce honey and the rock on the other side to dispense oil and nurse the infants. These children who had been saved and reared by the Shechina later recognized Hashem at the Yamsuf and exclaimed, This is my God and I will praise Him. The day on which Moshe was exposed to the waters of the Nile was the sixth of Sivan. The angels in heaven entreated Hashem, should Moshe perish on the day, on the same day, on the 6th of Sivan, the very day that he is destined to give the Torah to the children of Israel? But Hashem brought about Moshe's salvation, uh, Moshe's salvation in a most miraculous fashion. The very people that wanted to destroy him would be his saviors. So 
let's uh, let's talk about batya batya uh means bat yeah daughter of god now she was actually already called batya because paro taught himself to be a god and she rejected this name and um she called herself bat paro the daughter of paro um and she had long rejected uh, the cult of the Egyptians and accepted on herself the laws of the Jewish nation. Now, when she's going down to the Nile, where she sees Moshe Rabenu, sh she is going down to perform her mikvah. Because, right, to convert to Judaism, you need to go into a body of water um, and take upon yourself the laws of God. And um, so she was going down. It's also said that she. Uh, had Sarat kind of like a kind of leprosy and she was going to purify herself now every Shabbos we sing uh, We sing songs like when my husband comes home from the the synagogue First we we sing a song for the angels that accompanied him to tell them thanks for coming But now you can go because you're not welcome here because the Shabbos is only for Hashem and the Jews It's intimacy and that uh, you don't have a place here, right? So um, then after that, we sing a song called Eshet Chayel, A Woman of Valor. Now, the woman of valor, and I think we spoke about this a little bit before in regards to Sarah Amenu, um, that each line is actually representative, uh, representative, Repre represents um, uh, one of our ancestresses. And for Batya, her line is that she awakes while it's still dark. In the spiritual darkness of the house of Paro, even in that place of darkness, she knew that there is one God and that he is true and his ways are true. And she was able to wake up out of that darkness and come to him. So on this particular morning, oh, see, I always jump the gun. I get too excited. That's my problem. On this particular morning, she was walking to the river to wash herself because she suffered from leprosy. Suddenly she noticed a little basket floating on the waves and realized that it contained a child. And so she wanted to bring this child, but the problem was she couldn't reach the basket. But when... So she was about to abandon her plan, but God commanded the angel Gabriel to strike Moshe and cause him to cry to evoke Batya's mercy. And when she stretched out her arms and she couldn't reach, it says that she wanted it so badly. She wanted to grab this child so badly that her deep desire caused a miracle to happen for her at Hashem allowed her arms to extend 60 amot. Was it 60? I think it's specifically 60, but it says several. So it may or may not be right. But because she wanted so bad, Hashem made a miracle and her arms were outstretched. So she was able to grab Moshe Rabenu. And when she saw him, she was immediately healed from her leprosy. And she said, this must be a righteous child. And she decided that she would raise him. Hashem said, you adopted, a child that was, you adopted a child that was not your own, calling him your son, Hashem said, and in return, I will call you my daughter. And thereby, he gave her back her name, Batya, the daughter of God. When Batya examined the baby, she found him to be circumcised and surrounded by the glory of the Shekhinah. And she understood immediately that this was a Jewish child. He must be crying because he's hungry. Bring me a nurse. An Egyptian nurse was brought, but the infant refused to suckle. What's the matter, asked Batya? Get another woman, but Moshe would not drink from an Egyptian woman. The mouth that would later speak to Hashem was too holy to take milk from an impure source. Now, Moshe's sister Miriam, who had been observing the scene, now stepped forward and said, Shall I get you a very good Hebrew nurse? Yes, said Batya. Miriam ran home, returned with her mother, and the princess told Yocheved, Take him, he is yours. Unaffect unaware of the fact that these words were actually true nurse him and i shall pay you for your service do you see how perfect his limbs are the princess lifted the baby and showed him to his mother 
Make sure you return him to me healthy and well. I do not dare accept this task. I am afraid of your father's decree, said Yocheved. Do not fear, said the princess. It is for me that you are nursing him. Yocheved, who was the midwife Shifra, had saved Jewish children from death. And now God was rewarding her. Fill in the blank. You fill in the blank. Mita Kenegan Mita. She saved other Jewish babies. God saved her Jewish baby. She nursed him for 24 months, and then Batya asked her to bring him to the palace. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, so much it so much to say. My head is exploding. It's been too long since we had a video together. Okay, we're going to stop there. And uh, I look very forward to continuing the book of Shmot with you. You might also hear it pronounced Shmos. Uh, just like sometimes you hear people say Shabbos. Sometimes you hear people say Shabbat. You'll get used to it. Okay, have a great week. It's so nice to be back. And as always, my friends, it is so good to thank God, right? <laughs>